Well, grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Our text tonight is 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 16 and going to verse 21a, the first half of 21. Yeah. We all, uh, you might remember that chapters and verses are not something that are a part of the original uh, writing. They were added much, much later. In fact, chapters and verses come over a thousand years after um, these books come into being, um, especially the verses. The verses didn't come until the 16th century. So sometimes, you know, those verses get a little out of a line. And that's why we're going to only talk about 21a, because I think the second half of 21 really begins the next section um, where Paul begins to actually um, uh, boast. He starts boasting. So, Van, could you uh, shut that door back there for us, please? And thank you. So chapter 11, verses 16 to 21a. And, and, you know, it's a small section tonight. And when you read this, you might think, well, you know, we don't have to spend a whole lot of time with this because this is repetition in some ways. Paul's already said this, right? If you go back up to verses 1 and 2, he's basically repeating verses 1 and 2 in some ways. But what is really important about this particular text is how he describes what the Corinthians put up with. Which, in effect, is saying these are the sorts of things that the super apostles are doing. And you're putting up with it. You're allowing, you're, you're glorying in it. You're, you're boasting in it. You're, you're living in it. You're not even, you're not even confronting them about it. You know, at least some of you aren't, not necessarily everybody, not even necessarily most, but this is um, um, the way he describes them with five verbs is really, I think, quite weighty. That is, this tells us about the dynamics of what's going on in that congregation. And I want to suggest to you that those dynamics are not just about them. That we can see those same dynamics in churches today. And that's kind of why I think that one of this, this section is so important to grab hold of. Because these are practices that need to be confronted, as Paul would have hoped that the Corinthians would have confronted them. We don't want to put up with this stuff, even though the Corinthians, at least some of them, were putting up with it. So let's read the text, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 16. I repeat. Let no one think that I am a fool, but if you do, then accept me as a fool, so that I may, too, boast a little. What I'm saying in regard to this boastful confidence, I am saying not with the Lord's authority, but as a fool. Since many boast according to human standards, I will also boast. For you gladly put up with fools, being wise yourselves. For you put up with, you put up with it when someone makes slaves of you or preys upon you or takes advantage of you or puts on airs or gives you a slap in the face. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Again, this is a, a very brief section. And, and you get the sense in verses, the first two verses there, 16 and 17 particularly, but really 16, 17, and 18 are kind of a repetition of 
the points that Paul's already made. In fact, he tells us that, doesn't he? He says, I repeat, <laughs> you know, I, I want to tell you this again. It's kind of like Paul is really hesitant to do this boasting. He doesn't really want to do this boasting. Um, and so just make sure you got this. I'm going to tell you again what I've already told you. I don't like this. <laughs> All right. I, I'm going to play the fool here and boast because of your expectations. What you expect, I'm going to play the fool. Let no one think I'm actually I'm actual fool, though, because I know what I'm doing. I know that I'm going to boast in a way that is according to human standards. Or your translation might say what in verse um, verse 18? He's going to boast according to what? What the world does. Any other translation? According to the flesh. That's the literal translation. At human standards, right? So flesh, human standards. In other words, I'm going to boast in ways in which human beings boast. Worldly human beings. Human beings like in the Greco-Roman culture where boasting was a way of solidifying your credibility. Boasting in, and we've talked about some of this previously, you know, boasting in um, their rhetoric, their ability to speak. Remember any of the things in which they might be boasting? Their letters of commendation, their letter, their credential letters. You know? So they're good speakers, they got credentials from other places, they're successful, maybe they're wealthy. Maybe they, they don't suffer like Paul suffers. You know, they, they're blessed. Right? Yeah, they're blessed. You know, Paul, he suffers a lot. Something must be wrong. You know, that's not the way it's supposed to go, right? We, however, are blessed. You know, something like that. That that's the kind of boasting that is a street cred, you might say. Street cred, I should say. Sorry. Street cred in a Greco-Roman world. And Paul says, you know, these guys came into your town and they started boasting like this and they started comparing themselves with me and they think I'm inferior to them. And the reason they think they're, that I'm inferior is because of what they're boasting about. And you're putting up with that. You're listening to it as if that's the standard, as if that's the way we judge things, as if that's the way we discern things in the kingdom of God. That according to the gospel of Christ, we don't discern things because of how wealthy somebody is or how charismatic somebody is in terms of their speaking ability or how trained they are in rhetoric or how successful they are. That's, that's according to the flesh. And Paul says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. And in fact, he tells us in verse 17 that he's going to boast in such a way that it's not what? It's not what? With what? It's not Lord's authority. What did you say? Talking as the Lord would. Talking as the Lord would. What other translations do we have? Talk. Lord's authority. Lord's authority. Okay. Any other? It really just says according to the Lord. Just like according to the flesh. So Paul is drawing a parallel here, right? Boasting according to the Lord or boasting according to the flesh. And boasting according to the flesh is the sort of thing I just described a moment ago. But boasting according to the Lord would be what? What sort of thing is that kind of boasting? To boast according to the Lord. Okay. Well, yeah, he's going to boast in, in the weakness, right? So he's going to have this long list, including shipwrecks. He would have more humility. I mean, humility, right? Humility is going to be a part of that, boasting in the Lord, right? Absolutely. Remember um, at the end of chapter 10, where Paul said, when he quotes from Jeremiah, if anyone boasts, let them boast in the Lord, right? 
Let them get their credentials from the Lord. Let them get their blessings from the Lord. You know, let them get their ministry from the Lord. Um, boast in what God is doing through you and in you and around you. Boast in the Lord, not, not in my achievements, right? So we have this strong contrast, boasting according to the Lord and, and boasting according to the flesh. And Paul says that's, fool, that's, that's foolishness. So why is Paul willing to boast according to the flesh? Why would Paul do that? That's what they understand. That's what they understand. Okay. That's, that's how they would hear it. That's, that's what they would want to hear, right? All right. So Paul says, okay, it's foolish, but I'm going to do it because that's what you, you want to hear it that way, all right? Now, he's going to twist it, right? He's, going to, he's not going to do it exactly the way they want it to be heard. Uh, so there's some sarcasm, I think. In fact, you look at that last line where Paul says, um, um, I must say, we were too weak for that. <laughs> yeah, we didn't take advantage of you. We didn't prey on you. You know, we didn't put on some airs about you. We were too weak for that. You can almost hear in the background that these super apostles are looking at Paul saying, he's weak. Look how weak he is. He doesn't sound like much. He doesn't look like much. Um, he doesn't have much success. He's always in trouble. You know. He's always going in jail. You, know, you could just you let a preacher put that on their resume, right? Yeah, I've been in jail three times, you know, whatever. <laughs> Got flogged a few times. You know, it seems like something bad's happened to me all every time I turn around. You know, I'm in three shipwrecks, you know. What, you know, that you put that on your resume, that's not, uh, it's not the one you're going to invite, right? Um, but Paul says, I, I was just too weak. To I was too weak to treat them the way they treated you, which is sarcasm, right? Because he's using the word weak kind of with quotation marks, you know, air quotes. I was too weak for that. But boy, you sure put up with it. Right? Anything else come to mind in terms of um, why is he going to do this foolish thing? In verse 17, what does your translation say? What I am saying in regard to this boastful confidence. What, what word does your translation use there? Boastful confidence. First, the, the what? Self-confident boasting. Self boasting. Okay. Any other translation? It's kind of a boastful undertaking, a boastful substance. He's talking about the stuff of his boasting, right? The stuff of it. Um, I'm going to go do, I'm going to do this, but I'm not going to do it according to the Lord. I'm going to do it according to the flesh because I know that's what you'll understand. It's almost like Paul is, um, he's setting them up. Now, if you're a Corinthian and you're reading along, Okay, Paul's finally going to come clean and tell us what his credentials are. Paul's finally going to boast. He's finally going to respond to these super apostles and tell us why he's superior or why we should listen to Paul. And so they're kind of expecting a similar list, right? A list that would, in fact, respond and say, hey, I'm just as, I'm just as, I'm as equal with these guys as they think I am, you know. They think I'm inferior, but, but I, got, I got the same kind of credentials that they have. And I think Paul is setting them up to expect that. I'm going to boast according to the flesh. But when we get there, that's not what Paul does. Right? So it's, a, it's, all, it's kind of a, a piece of rhetorical device, right? To set up these expectations and then cut it out from under them. Right? Paul's playing with them a little bit, <laughs> right? And uh, to a rhetorical effect, that is, so that they would um, 
uh, it might shock them. Oh, that's what you mean. Oh, that's what you're talking about. Right. But I think the heart of what we read tonight is verses 19 and 20. This is where I want to concentrate. <laughs> Verses 19 and 20. For you gladly put up with fools, being wise yourselves. Okay, that sounds like Miss Pat, that, that sounds like sarcasm, doesn't it? Yeah. You're so wise, you put up with fools. Yeah, I think my mama would slap me across the face if I said that to somebody. <laughs> you know, that, that kind of um, raw sarcasm which typically I don't, I'm not a sarcastic kind of person. I don't typically do that sort of thing. Yeah. More like a smart aleck. Yeah. That, that, that'd be kind of how in my family we would name that, but it does, does show how emotive Paul is here. He's emotionally engaged and he's pulling out all the tools available to him, rhetorical tools to persuade the Corinthians, to remind the Corinthians. And so maybe some people needed to hear the sarcasm. Some people needed to hear the shock of that language that you put up with fools because you're so wise. You know, is that how wise you are that you put up with these people? And in verse 20, we get a description of what these people are doing. Now, this is, this is where I really wanna focus. Because I think we have, we have a description of what they put up with. What the Corinthians put up with. And it's five verbs or five phrases. So let's get them on the board here. The first one, what is your trans? My translation says, someone makes slaves of you enslaved okay someone enslaves you any other translation brings you into bondage someone brings you into bondage okay any other translation it is uh, it's very strong language as enslavement would be bondage would be um it is uh it's in fact it's emphatic language Someone brings you into slavery. Someone makes you a slave. Someone forces you into slavery, you might say. Uh, I, I think of that kind of as a domineering enslavement. So what do you think he's saying about these intruders? What would, what, when you hear domineering enslavement, or they make you slaves, what what, what are you thinking about when you say that? What comes to your mind? What sort of situation would that, can you think of a situation that you would describe that way? They would talk down to them. Okay, talk down to them, have a sense of authority over them. All right. We're going to tell you what to do. All right. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. In the, in the temple context, where we had the um, the money changers in the temple, yeah, that kind of domineering that uh, in the Pharisees' reaction, as you're saying. Any other? You know, it's kind of kind of authoritarianism. You 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 come into this community, and you take charge. And you dominate. Yeah, yeah, it could be a form of legalism as well. Yeah, that sort of thing. All right, let's go to the second one. What's the second thing he says? Not only make slaves of you, my translation says, or praise upon you. Pra exploits you. Exploits you, okay. Exploitation is kind of a broad word that we could use in several ways. Um, but it works here. Exploit, prey. Devours. 
So what, what kind of imagery? Devour, prey, what kind of imagery is in play? Attack. attack. Okay, an attack. What kind of an attack? Think National Geographic attack. Like yeah. A lion. <laughs> yeah, that kind of prey. Yeah, yeah. So it's more, it's kind of like a predator. Yeah, these are, these are predators, right? So you might think of this in terms of um, predatorial practices. Predatorial practices. They are, they're out to get something from you. They're, they're devouring you. They are seeing you as an object that they can get something from you. You know, whether it's a lying, eating a gazelle, right? They're going to they're get something from you, but they're going to attack you in doing it. These are like wild animals who are um, preying on you. And you put up with it. You put up with it. Right. What's the next verb? You pray, or next, mine says, takes advantage of you. Right. Takes advantage of you. Anybody else? Take captive. Take captive? Okay. That kind of, it's kind of like the first one. Um, this word is, it's actually the word kind of receive. So they, they, they receive something from you. What are they receiving from the Corinthians? Money. Money. Okay. They're, so they're, they're, overcharging. they're overcharging or, or they're, they're, they're using them, right? They're taking advantage. They're using them. Or maybe this is where the word exploit can fit pretty well. They are ex ex exploitation. They're exploiting the Corinthians. And maybe that's a financial thing. And maybe it's more than that. Um, what's the fourth verb? Puts on airs is my translation. New RSV. Pushes themselves forward. Pushes themselves forward. That's an interesting translation. Yeah. Yeah. I think that fits. Anybody else? Exalts themselves. Exalts themselves. Okay. So how would you, what would be in some language, other language that would be synonymous with that sort of thing? What are we talking about here? They think they're better than anybody else. Okay, they think they're better. Narcissism. All right. What? Narcissism. narcissism, okay. Pride, yeah, narcissism. Titles and labels. Labels and titles, titles and labels, okay. That would be part of that pride, and that haughtiness. That, that would be an expression of it, wouldn't it? Very Arrogance, okay. Puts on airs. Puts on airs, right? Yeah, that's the new RSV, right? So maybe we could talk about um, what would be a way of describing that that the that they are haughty. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. They think they're superior. They think they're superior. Okay, so there's a uh, yeah a haughty superiority. I think they're superior to Paul, for example, right? So, a haughty superiority. They think they're something. <laughs> right? Then the last verb gives you a slap in the face. Any other translation? I'm sorry? Distract. Strike. Oh, okay. Strike you in the face. Strike. Okay. Yeah. Slap. Strike. Something violent here. But I don't. I don't think the that it's a literal violence in the sense of an actual physical violence. It's not that the intruders are coming in and literally pushing people around, right, or striking them in a literal physical sense. But it's a metaphor for the sort of thing they are doing. They're coming into the community and slapping people's faces. Humiliating them, okay? Humiliating people. Um, abusing people. 
words with words, right? So kind of verbal abuse sort of thing, or maybe even some practices that are abusive, right? So maybe, maybe we can say um, abusive practices. Now you look at that and that's quite a list. <laughs> you know, pause it. You put up with this. What, what's wrong with you people? Why, why would you put up with that? These intruders have come in and this is how they treat you. And you go along with it because you think they are credentialed. You think they have power. You think they have authority. You think they have the right, right? Um, but Paul wants to draw a contrast between that and Paul behavior. And here's where we need to kind of remember the whole letter of 2 Corinthians. Because part of what Paul is doing is contrasting. Remember earlier in the letter, we, we, we kind of said, well, you know, he may be contrasting with the super apostles here, but we had not got to that yet. Well, now's, now's the time we need to kind of go back a little bit and look at Paul's behavior, because Paul's behavior is on the other end of this. So, for example, 1 Corinthians, I mean, not 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 24. Someone read that for us. 2 Corinthians 1, 24. What does Paul say there? Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for joy. Not that we lord it over your faith. Not that we exercise lordship over your faith. Not that we exercise a master. We're not a master of your faith. We're not the master. Right? You're not my slave. You're not my slave. I don't, master, I don't exercise authority or mastery over your faith. I don't exercise lordship over your faith. That was back in chapter 1, verse 24. So Paul, Paul is saying, okay, they treat you like domineering and slavers, right? But I do not exercise. I don't exercise lordship over you. I'm not your master. You're not my slaves. No. There's an embedded contrast. So you go back to chapter 1, verse 24. Why would he say that? I am not your master, but I work with you. So why would Paul say that? Well, probably because he's already thinking about the contrast between the super apostles and himself. I'm not like them. I don't come in and just order you around. I'm here to work with you in joy, not out of fear, not out of even command. Remember in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, I'm not telling you this by way of command. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm not going to command you. Because right? I'm not your master. Or look at the second one here. Predatorial practices. Um, go back up to chapter 11, verse 9. Chapter 11, verse 9. It says, when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone. I didn't burden anyone. I'm, I'm not after what you got. You know, I, I'm not going to say, okay, you have to do this for me. I'm not here to gain from you. Right? I'm not a burden. I'm not going to treat you like an object that I'm going to get something from. 
Rather, I'm going to release you from any burdens. Right? Or you get the same thing if you go back, go down to chapter 12. Getting ahead of ourselves here. Chapter 12, verse 14. When he says, and I, here I am, ready to come to you this third time. And I will not be a burden because I do not want what is yours. But you. I don't, I don't want what you have. I don't want yours. I don't want what you own, what you possess. I just want to be in a relationship with you. I'm not going to be a burden. Or look at this next line, exploitation. Got to remember several times Paul is very clear about his motives. Here in chapter 12, in fact, go down to verse 16. Let it be assumed that I did not burden you. Nevertheless, you say, since I was crafty, I took it in, took you in by deceit. He's being accused of being crafty in order to exploit the Corinthians. But if you go back to chapter 4, verse 2, Paul has already responded to this. In chapter 4 and verse 2, someone want to read that for us? 2 Corinthians 4, verse 2. things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, okay. but by manifestation of the truth. Right. We don't handle the word of God deceitfully. We're not crafty. We're, hand, we're, we're being honest. We're being open. Paul has already said, I'm not like that. I'm like this. Right. So Paul is saying he, he's not crafty. He's not cunning. He's not, he's not a deceiver, all right? He's not any of those things. He comes honest. I'm not out to exploit you or to get something out of you, right? Or now haughty superiority. Let's go back to chapter 11 and verse 7. In chapter 11, verse 7, where do you see a contrast with haughtiness? Yeah, I'm, I'm humbling. Humility. I'm, humility. Humility, right. I, did I commit a sin by humbling myself among you? Paul, Paul is saying, you know, I, I, I humbled myself by working. I wasn't a burden to you. I wasn't trying to exploit you. I wasn't trying to deceive you. I wasn't treating you like an object. I was... I was, uh, I humbled myself and worked with my hands, so I was not a burden to you. And then the last one, abusive. Think about kind of like domestic abuse or parental abuse or, you know, the, the way people relate, have abusive relationships, whether it's in a domestic context, parents or spouses. And Paul responds to that, doesn't he? That he's not, he's not abusive. In what way? How does Paul, you remember how Paul has described himself in his relationship to Corinth? What's a, what's a, you remember a metaphor? Like a parent, yeah, like a parent-child relationship, right. He says, I'm a father to you. I'm, I treat you like a father treats his children. That's how I think of you. Uh, we can see it in, if you go to chapter 6, verse 13. Someone read that for us. Chapter 6, verse 13. Yeah, I speak as to my children. I'm talking to you as my children. In other words, I, this is a, a loving relationship that he has with the Corinthians. He loves them. That's why he doesn't burden them, because he loves them. Even though they experience Paul's manner among them, given their Greco-Roman culture, they experience Paul's manner as, as uh, subterfuge, as uncredentialed, as inferior. But Paul said, I, I come to you in this way because I love you. You're my children. Right? So he acts 
as a father. Which is exactly how he explains himself in chapter 12, verse 14. If you go to chapter 12, verse 14, where he says, I will not be a burden when I come this third time because I do not want what is yours, but you for children ought not to lay up for their parents, but parents for their children. In other words, I, I'm, your, I'm, I'm your parent. That's the relationship I want with you. So I'm not going to abuse you. Now, of course, according to the flesh, there are a lot of abusive parents. Right? That happens all the time. Um, and in the church, there are abusive practices as well. But Paul is offering a, a different model. So here's kind of models of ministry. Models of ministry. And it, this is, uh, I think this is such an important little uh, verse. Because it, it packs a wallop. Because it speaks right to the gut of how ministry and how leadership and how dysfunctional churches can be. A church can have a dysfunctional leadership that abuses people, that are predators, that are power hungry, that are money centered, right? and exploitive of others, exploitive of their members by trying to wring all the money they can out of them or whatever, right? Give $50 and I'll send you a book, the preacher says, right? Or one preacher had his church buy enough copies of his book so that when it came out, he would be on the bestseller list. That happened. Or a preacher says uh, he's so haughty, so superior, that he says, I'm not going to take advice from anybody who has a smaller church than me. That happens. Or people who are in churches because children are easy targets in, church, in churches. And the predator is among us. Right? And, I, you know, we could just go on and on. These sorts of practices, domineering enslavement, a form of legalism that can enslave people and get people to conform to certain practices through threats of hell and so on, you know. That's kind of an enslaving bondage. And churches do that. Not all churches, of course. But I imagine there's some of this in every church, in one way or another, because it's filled with human beings. And so Paul is calling, calling us to an awareness of these kinds of practices that should not be a part of the church. That the way we minister to each other is not out of a pride. It's not out of a sense of what can I get from you or what's in it for me. But it is a sense of humility, a sense of servanthood, a sense of giving, of reciprocity, rather than these other factors. I mean, the headlines are full of this stuff, right? This is why the church is getting such a black eye in social media. Because they're, in social media, you're able to point out these things that used to be hidden and remained hidden. Right? And when you hide the secrets, it just gets deeper and more cancerous. And ultimately, it kills it. Right? 
This is such a serious problem in the contemporary church. You don't have to go far to find it. You can watch some television preachers and find it, right? You can look at some elders, leadership groups and find it. Um, and Paul says, you put up with it. Yeah, uh, I wonder, I wonder how we would hear that ourselves if Paul were saying this, and you put up with that. You think that's okay. You're used to it. Or you have such respect for these people, or they are so knowledgeable, or they're so well-trained, or they're so, you know, Paul says, that doesn't matter. Not when they're engaging in these kinds of practices. Right? So would that get in trouble distinguishing weakness from humility? Yeah, I think um, the question is the distinguishing weakness from humility. Because when you boast in your suffering, in the Greco-Roman culture, that's a, that's a weakness. You don't boast in your suffering. You're a weak person if you do that. Whereas Paul, when he boasts in his suffering, is humility is the primary thing, right? And it's also about giving God the glory for whatever God does, you know, in the midst of our weakness. Yeah, exactly. In the midst of our weakness. So, yeah. So some cultures here, I, I imagine if you were in Putin's room, I imagine weakness would not be humility in his mind. Right, strength, power, violence that would be what is uh, strong. And if you're, gonna, if you're gonna be humble, then you're just a weak person, right? That kind of thing. So, yeah, I think that that fits. No, I, I think when you, when you hear the language, um, going back to chapter 11 and verse 20. When you hear the language, you put up with it when, and then we get these five phrases, you put up with it. Yeah, I wish, I, I wish we had a tone of voice translation, right? What tone of voice would Paul have in that? Would it be kind of a, an upset tone of voice? You put up with it. Would it be a, a sad voice? Like, oh, you put up with that. Would it be kind of a frustrated voice? I can't believe this, that you put up with that. I mean, what, what would be the tone of voice if Paul were reading this to the church? Yeah. Uh, disappointment? I can't believe this. You, you put up with this. He's disappointed with the church. He's clearly disappointed with Corinth. He's He's upset that he has to, that he has to even boast like a fool for their sake. I would say it's be hurt. Be hurt. Okay, hurt. He'd be sad about it. Be hurt. Yeah. Because um, he hoped better for them. All right. We want better for them. And so when I, when I see the church, you know, I see the contemporary church filled with this sort of stuff. I think it is painful. It, it's something to weep over. It is something to, to cry over, feel sad about. Also, I, you know, I feel disappointed in it too. I feel disappointed that there are people who have been Christians for 30 years or leaders in churches for long lengths of time and they're still doing this kind of stuff. That's disappointing. And it's one of the reasons why so many people are leaving the churches. Because that's what they see. That's what they hear about. And they're disappointed in that. And rightly so to be disappointed. Okay, but here's the point. Paul, he's disappointed. He's sad. But does he give up on him? No, he doesn't give up on him. He loves the church. 
He loves the Corinthians. He's not going to just drop them. He doesn't say, okay, I'm done with you. You want the super apostles? Have at it. No, he fights for them because he loves them. He's disappointed, but he loves the church. And I think that that's, that's the tension that I see in a lot of young people, a lot of young ministers, a lot of young ministers who are enslaved by elders. I mean, literally so. They have shackles on them. They can't speak their own mind. They can't teach as they see it. They are shackled in ways and they are exploited because this is their livelihood for their family and their options are limited. They've been trained for this. They've been called to this. And yet they find themselves in a situation where the leadership is just uh, strangling them. And on the other hand, I see ministers who are doing the exploiting as well, whether by outrageous salaries, making half a million a year. I mean, that's, that's a real one, half a million a year. Or when you get into the television evangelists, we're talking about even more money, right? Larger amounts of money that are being paid by widows sending in their seed money, which is what Jesus talked about, exploiting widows. He condemned the Pharisees for exploiting widows. You know, I, I think we ought to get angry about this because it is destroying the church. And we're losing a whole generation because this is what they see. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Why, why couldn't they see this? It's it's like fish sw swimming in water. You know, they don't know they're swimming in water. They're just living, right? They don't know what it means to be out of water. It's just where they are. And it's how the culture and how expectations, whether it's expectations in, in their own Christian heritage or expectations in the culture. For the Corinthians, it's that Greco-Roman culture that gave them a certain perception. Right? But yeah, you have a comment on that? Yeah, probably. I mean, large Gentile. We don't really know the, the compilation in terms of percentages, but... Definitely both Jewish and Gentile Christians in this congregation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that could be part of it. That could be part of it. I think it's what we're used to. Yeah, what we're used to. We're comfortable with what we're used to. It's familiar. And it's hard to see the wrong in it when it's familiar. Right? It's hard to see, well, this is, you know, this is what we've been doing for a long time, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's hard to, hard to break out of that. It's hard to break out of your paper bag, you know, that you're in. Um, and so we need, we need outsiders sometimes to point to us. We need, we need people outside the church and in the culture to say, why do you let that child predator uh, participate in your children's classes. Why do you do that? We have learned out here that that is a recipe for disaster. And we say, well, we believe in forgiveness. Well, forgiveness doesn't mean we endanger children. Right? If a person is really penitent of their predatorial practices, part of the fruit of repentance is they'll accept the boundaries that are placed on them for their protection as well as the children, you know? So you know, that's, that is the struggle here. But I want to come back to the point. I love the church 
and I want the church to flourish. And I want people to, to enjoy relationships and be encouraged by those relationships. And that's why we have to confront these practices and be upfront about it and honest about it and put in place boundaries that are necessary to protect the flock and protect against these kinds of practices. But what I say to, my, to, to the younger generation that is, that is leaving the church, I understand why you're leaving. When this is what you see, I, I would ask, with Paul, you put up with that? No. No, I'm, that generation said, I'm not going to put up with that. And I'm saying, well, you shouldn't put up with it. Let's confront it and correct it. Let's engage it. Let's act on it. Let's, let's fight it. Because we love the church. And we love the people in the church. And if we fight these abusive practices and we um, are clear about that and bear witness to that, then others will see, oh, you really mean what you say. You really do confront people with these practices. And you really do love the people who are among you. Because if we're going to love the church, that means we protect the church from abusers. And we name them. Right? And when we do that, other people will see that that's what we're doing. And I think that's what a lot of the younger generation are they're looking for that. They want to they know. When there's another headline about a pedophile in a church or another... Um, uh, child is abused in a church they don't want to hear excuses from churches they don't want to hear about oh well you know we'll just forgive and it'll be okay they want to hear what Paul does here I can't believe you put up with that I can't believe you hid that all for the reputation of your church, you put it on the back burner and hid it in your files and dealt with it internally rather than naming it for what it is. I can't believe you put up with it. Paul's disappointed, hurt, but he still loves the church and he's going to fight for the church. And we should fight for the church too, I think. But we got to oppose the evil that we see in the church. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.